Good evening. Well, if you've been with us for the last uh, three weeks as far as the devotions that I've done on the previous Fridays, you know that I've been talking about some misconceptions we have about Christmas and also about these mysterious wise men or magi, magi, magos, as the original uh, scriptures in the Greek language refer to them. But this evening, what I want us to think about is these gifts that these wise men brought of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, even though they might have been disappointed that they didn't see this king that they were expecting to see in a palace, uh, they weren't greeted by an entourage of people in Jerusalem, which was the capital that they were expecting to see this king in, uh, instead, they were greeted by Herod, who was a Roman official that was referred to as King Herod. And uh, instead of them being able to present these expensive gifts in a royal setting, they were directed to go to a common house in a common neighborhood in what seemed to be a common family. And yet, they still offered these expensive gifts to this child. And again, remember, Jesus wasn't blonde-headed. Uh, he wasn't light-skinned. Uh, he was born a Jewish person into uh, the tribe of Judah for the nation of Israel. But ultimately, he came for all people. This was God's plan through this Messiah. So we pick up the story in Matthew chapter 2, because by the time the wise men arrived at the house where Jesus was, he could have been as old as two years old. And uh, I'm going to pick up uh, how we know that. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 7, uh, reminding you of this, after the Magi came and were looking for Jesus at uh, Jerusalem, and they came to Herod, who was referred to as the king. They expected it would be somebody associated with him, but of course it wasn't. It says in Matthew chapter 2, verse 7, Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. Herod wanted to understand how long ago it was that these wise men, these Magi, Magi, these astrologers, astronomers, how long ago it had been that they had seen the sign of this promised king being born because he wanted to calculate how old this child might be by the time the wise men had arrived. Therefore, he could have an idea of how old this child might be, not because he wanted to go worship this child, but because he wanted to eliminate the competition. He wanted to eliminate this child. So it goes on in verse 8, says, He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Again, that was not his intent. He wanted to get rid of this child. And we're going to see that as we go on in, in the passage. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen, when it rose, went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Again, another misconception. This was not... At this point, some solar event or uh, astronomical event of an alignment of stars up in the heavens, this was something close to Earth, a supernatural light or star that directed them exactly to the house and the place where Jesus was. Uh, pick it up there um, on verse 11, Matthew 2, 11. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. So again, he wasn't in a manger at this point, uh, a feeding trough for animals. He wasn't in some stable or cave. He was actually in a house because quite some time had passed from the time of his birth. And that was this journey that these wise men had been on for perhaps months, maybe even up to a year from the place that they traveled from, whether it was Babylon, modern-day Iraq, or whether it was uh, Persia or modern-day Iran. Somewhere in that region, we don't know, but that's where they traveled from to come to this neighboring nation and to try to develop a good rapport between the two countries. That's why they wanted to come and offer these gifts to this royal king that was born. That's why I wonder if they were disappointed when they saw things turn out the way that, that it did. And at the same time, they still offered the gifts. They didn't take them back. They didn't say, well, this is disappointing. We're just going to return home. 
in faith because of how they had sensed God's hand guiding them, even though they didn't know fully who this God was, they were acting by faith and trusting and being obedient to carry out and give these gifts. It says, on coming to the house, they saw the child and his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now this is where we begin to see the gifts that they offered to Mary and Joseph, who were not people who were wealthy. Uh, they were probably pretty lower middle class to possibly even poor class, probably poor class. Joseph was a carpenter, we know this, so at least he was able to make a living, but they certainly were not wealthy. Well, anyway, we pick it up in verse 13. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. There are many prophecies about Messiah, and it was hard for people to understand exactly how this Messiah could fulfill all these different prophecies because he was supposed to be from Galilee, which is Nazareth, the hometown of, of Joseph and, and Mary, or where they worked and lived, and yet he was to be born in Bethlehem, which was down next to Jerusalem, Bethlehem of Judea, and yet also it said he was to come out of Egypt. Well, when we understand how God worked through all of these tribulations, difficulties, and troubles in Mary and Joseph's life and in the early life of Jesus before, during, and after his birth, we see how God was coordinating all these things to bring to fulfillment all of these prophecies about Jesus. Here's the thing. How did Mary and Joseph survive in Egypt? Because they didn't have time to take a lot of stuff with them. They had to just get up and flee and go to Egypt. Well, they had these gifts that these wise men had given them, these very precious and expensive gifts worth a lot of money, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And though it's not specifically mentioned in the Bible, it's obvious that they used these gifts that these wise men had given to them and to Jesus to sustain them while they were in Egypt. They were able to sell the gold or use the gold and sell the frankincense and myrrh and to get money for it in order to have lodging in Egypt, to get food, uh, to get transportation, whatever they needed. It was provided through these gifts. And this is the point of this story, is that we need to be faithful in offering to God what we have, and he'll take that and he'll use it to further his ministry in the world. So we'll pick it up in verse 16. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted about by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, here's the key, who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. So this is why back in verse 7, he asked specifically when the star appeared because he wanted to figure out how old this child might be so he could figure out who, what age range he was going to eliminate. Herod was a very wicked person. Um, so uh, again, we pick it up uh, in verse 17. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for his, her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. You know, it's really sad, but when God is in the midst of working in the world, Satan is also working to try to fight against what God is doing. And so we see this constant spiritual struggle that is exemplified in physical ways. So in our life, as we seek to follow God and honor him, we need to trust him and not be surprised when difficulties come, but God will get us through. So we're going to finish this story up now in Matthew chapter 2, verse 19. It says this, After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, 
took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judah in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he, meaning Jesus, would be called a Nazarene. Through all of the difficulties and the circumstances of life, God is sovereign. He has a plan. He worked that plan through his son Christ. He used Mary and Joseph and the wise men and so many people uh, to accomplish his will. And so I want to encourage you. You may feel like you're not that important, uh, or you may feel like you're really important. I don't know. But the point is this. You need to humble yourself and trust this God who coordinates all things, even in the face of adversity and disappointments, because God is at work and doing amazing things, working his sovereign will and his plan. And part of that sovereign will and plan is that he wants you to acknowledge your sinfulness, your unbelief, and stop unbelieving and start believing in him, trusting in what he has done for you and me through his son Christ and what he offers to you and I today through forgiveness of sins and an offer to be in relationship with him and part of his family, not only now in this life, but forevermore eternal um, in the presence of God and the true royal courts of heaven. So put your faith in him and give him what you can and trust that God's going to provide for you in ways that you never imagined. God bless you.